Welcome to the podcast of the Global Mobility Project at The Ohio State University. I'm Jeffrey Cohen, Professor of Anthropology. Our project integrates the insights of the arts, humanities, and social sciences to facilitate a conversation of how local culture and individual decision-making inform and reflect the complex global forces behind mobility. During the 2016-2017 academic year, we are hosting a lecture series on the topic, Immigrants and Refugees, Comparative Experiences. Today's speaker is Professor Ibrahim Serkechi, RIA Professor of Transnational Studies and Marketing and Director of the Center for Transnational Studies at Regents University London. Later today, here at OSU, he will present the lecture, Europe's Crisis, Turkey's Refugees and Refugees from Turkey. We have just a few questions, and we'll start. What is the role of the humanities and arts in addressing this global challenge? I think the main thing humanities and arts can do or have a role is to express migration and migration stories, so increase awareness about it. One major problem we face in this quote-unquote global challenge is misconstrued perceptions about mobility and, and movers and migrants. They're often depicted as some kind of evil. Humanities and arts can perhaps get real stories through, and non-movers may have a more balanced understanding of what a migrant or refugee look like in real life. And that's an important contribution. You know, it can change a thing or two. They're not aliens from outer space. They have desires, passions, skills. They eat, drink, sleep. They have sex, like anybody else. They are normal in every sense, including that they seek security. They avoid conflicts and insecurities wherever they are coming from. They look for jobs. They look for opportunities, safety. And, you know, if you want to hear a positive thing, they seek happiness. So migration is always about happiness, being happy, but somewhere else. So these stories can be told by, you know, humanities and arts more often and louder. So migrants, refugees become human again, not just numbers. However disturbing and troubled these stories might be, they are worth telling and passing on. Equally important is that humanities and arts can tell the historic stories of population movements because we are often disconnected with you know, what happened in 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So this may help also non-movers reconnecting with movers and movers of their own ancestry. Because at the end of the day, more or less, if you dig down like three or four generations, Almost everybody is a migrant or somehow connected to migrants, including the Queen of England. She is a second generation or third generation migrant, anyway, from a Danish grandmother. In brief, we need more books and more movies, more novels, more plays, more paintings, more photography, and more storytelling about Moors. I think that is where humanities arts can come in. Thank you. There are complex reasons why people are on the move, from war and violence to economic insecurity to environmental change. Based on your research, why do people leave home? Ooh, because they are so happy. <laughs> of course, I'm joking. No, I mean, first, we need to correct that, you know, that 65.3 million is the number of displaced, including internally displaced people. So refugees are a subgroup within this, a small proportion of that. Total refugee population is estimated to be 21 million this year. Nevertheless, what we argue in reference to conflict model of migration is that one way or another, all movers, 250 million or more, move to avoid insecurities. Hence, all movements are in a way similar to refugee flows, which tends to be more abrupt and sudden, but motivations are similar. What drives people from their homes, from their countries, is pretty much similar. And it's a combination of many things, including politics, the disadvantages, discrimination, but also lack of opportunities, you know, environmental disasters and whatever else you can think and relate to. Asking the reverse question might be more useful and eye-opening. Why people do not move? Why only about 3% of the world today are international migrants? I mean, first thing is because moving somewhere else or leaving home is costly, difficult, and often emotionally burdening. And when you think about these people moving like, you know, from Syria or from Afghanistan or from Iraq, you may think it's an easy, easy decision because there's war. But even under war situations, war circumstances, it is very difficult. It is still very emotionally costly. And of course, it is 
financially costly and people take risk of losing their lives as well. So Moors are not thieves and murderers who go around, do, do killing and come back with trophies. As often portrayed in right-wing media, despite all the free will and voluntary migration crap, forgive language, Moors are often obliged to make a decision. It is not a choice, but yet it is a decision. Syrians are not choosing between harm, death and migration. There is fire, they are fleeing. Of course, if you are obnoxious enough, you can say they have a choice, they can stay and burn. Movers make drastic decisions and moving to another country is much more complex and dangerous today than it was 50 years ago. Despite tremendous improvements in transport and communication technologies and much progress in human rights, migration regimes, policies are tougher than ever. We even have migration repelling armies such as Frontex in Europe. So not only movers like Syrians who face war and death on a daily basis are at risk and taking risks, but at much less intense fashion, all movers face serious risks. Filipino domestic workers arriving in Arab Gulf countries face risks such as being beaten or raped by their employers. They face being not paid, they face being prisoned for simply changing jobs. Eastern European migrant workers arriving in the UK do hard work and live in often miserably overcrowded houses and they sacrifice comfort. They risk now being assaulted on the street by racist thugs. So there is a much smaller group of movers who appear safe and far from harm, such as academics and some other professionals. This is not true at all. We talk about glass ceiling for women. That glass is much thicker for migrants, men and women alike. So that is the bottom line, like why people move and why they don't move is all those insecurities and risks. Thank you very much. And that brings us to um, our third question. Uh, and you've already begun to, I think, answer it a little. The influx of refugees and immigrants in Europe and the USA has caused a great deal of debate in recent years in political arenas and elsewhere. Even though the largest number of newcomers worldwide is not in the West, based on your work, how do communities accept those newcomers? I, mean, I have been studying integration quite a long while, I think. And to be honest, I'm not sure if we can talk about successful integration at all. And the nature of human mobility and things surrounding are not so conducive for integration. There's one problem inherent to the process. When you leave your home, leave your country, home turf, if you like, you are breaking with your networks, or at least they become looser. Even in this age of ubiquitous connectedness, in the destination, the host societies usually have all positions taken in local networks. People do not necessarily look for new members. Then the newcomer struggles. Movers are more likely to engage and integrate with other movers and outliers of the mainstream population wherever they arrive in. This is a very common dilemma for the first generations. In later generations this eases off, but still the pace of this is different between, for example, visible and non-visible minorities and also traditionality in the community in terms of identity, belonging and, you know, alignments, it can be longer or shorter. I spent a long time studying minorities in the UK and labor market outcomes. This is just one aspect of integration and we know some decisive factors are in play there, like language skills, knowing the culture, not only like culture in general, but culture of how people get employed, how people are recruited, traditions, rules, maturity, duration of stay, all correlate positively with integration. But society is stubbornly discriminatory and perhaps with a degree of racism too. So we have completed a field survey in Turkey just last year and we haven't analyzed the data yet. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see similar patterns in Turkey too, like in the UK. Like in many countries, the mainstream group pays lip service to tolerance and inclusiveness. However, what happens in the neighborhood when movers of different backgrounds arrive is another story. Turkish people love to boast about, you know, how hospitable and tolerant Turks are. And you can probably find many other examples around the world doing the same. It is true, they love their guests, but who doesn't? It's important to underline the guest here. The problem becomes crucial when these guests decide to stay. This is what is happening with over 3 million Syrians in Turkey now. About a year after the arrival of the first groups, I gave an interview to a Turkish newspaper and said, you should prepare to live with Syrians. They are here to stay for good. And I received so many insulting comments from readers. 
The history with the Kurds, Alevis and other minorities in Turkey unfortunately doesn't promise much hope. This is not to discredit what Turkey did for Syrian refugees so far. I mean, we should all applaud and, you know, celebrate what they are doing, generously hosting so many millions of them. But Turkey hosts the largest refugee population in the world now, and about two-thirds of Syrians are accommodated there. So many Turks are trying very hard to help the refugees, and this is also admirable. And it's not for three or six billion euros promised by Europe, and that amount of money anyway will possibly never reach Turkey. And it doesn't exist. They just promised to raise that much money to support Syrian refugees. But this is where it ends. The integration story is pretty much a mission impossible, at least for you know earlier generations or early arrivals. But in the long run, like most economists say, they are dead. We can't promise on this. Well, thank you very much for talking with us this morning. We've been talking with Professor Ibrahim Serkeci, RIA Professor of Transnational Studies and Marketing and Director of the Center for Transnational Studies at Regents University in London. And he will uh, be speaking later today as part of the program Immigrants and Refugees Comparative Experiences here at OSU in the Mershon Center. His talk is entitled Europe's Crisis, Turkey's Refugees and Refugees from Turkey. Thanks very much. Thank you.